Hey, I'm Scott Perdue, and today on Flywire, I'm going to give you an update on the Ukraine war situation uh, from my perspective. And uh, I just thought I'd uh, do this. I found a few new things out, and some stuff is happening. I think that uh, um, kind of uh, follows what I, my, my uh, first video is. So the first thing I want to talk about is no fly zones. Uh, one thing is that I, I failed to mention before is uh, I've flown a couple of these uh, UN no-fly zones, and they're a lot more, they're a lot harder and more complicated than uh, people realize to put together. And one of the things that is a factor for the no-fly zones we've done in the past is they haven't been opposed. In other words, all that stuff I was talking about before about SAMs. Uh, well, most of the Russian SAMs are being fired from outside of the Ukraine, so what that means is is they're still there. And uh, that makes it a, a potential problem for anybody uh, trying to operate inside that no-fly zone to enforce it, okay? So then that means you'd have to enforce it by attacking those, uh, uh, those SAM sites uh, if you can operate with impunity. Not going to happen. So no-fly zone, again, is not a great idea. But the interesting thing, I think, is, is that the no-fly zone is essentially there. The uh, light, I'm going to talk about uh, loss numbers here in just a minute, but uh, as of a couple of days ago, the loss was pegged at 81, and it's been level at uh, 81 Russian airplanes uh, for about, I want to say, 10 days almost. So uh, I think it's kind of stabilized there, and it, it appears that there's really, as I said before in the first video, there's only some had been run. some hit and run attacks, but that's about it. So essentially, the no fly zone is working. And in my opinion, the ask for a no-fly zone is more about leverage than it is about reality. Um, even the MiG-29s. I mean, you, you, you try to, you, yeah, okay, they operate MiG-29s, but what version are they? What are the avionics? You know, what is the maintenance on them? All this stuff. Where are they going to operate them from? Uh, as I said before in the first video, there's really no air base that's hardened to, to be able to operate those airplanes from. So having fighters like that, you can't fly them from Poland. Uh, you know, it's just a huge problem. So that's the update on the no-fly zone. Essentially, it exists. What it does is, is it drives the Russian to use and standoff weapons. And uh, we're going to talk more about that here in just a second. Uh, strategy. It looks like uh, essentially that uh, the strategy is playing out, as I said. Um, as, I pred as I predicted, or I think it's going to, uh, basically they're going to level, uh, level things and uh, then... Are they going to take uh, the rest of uh, the southern uh, uh, port cities and for the Black Sea? I don't know. We'll see. If things aren't going super well for the Russians right there right now, it's kind of a stalemate. Uh, and the problem with the leveling strategy is it takes a lot of time. And I think that's one thing that is becoming kind of interesting that the Russians really don't have a lot of. Uh, they're running out of equipment, they're running out of uh, tanks and airplanes and people, in particular people. As I said, we're going to talk about the lost numbers here in just a second, but uh, this is pretty important. Uh, they're taking, uh, they're, they're advertising for foreign fighters to come fight for them. I'm not so sure what the cause there would be, but uh, they're, they're basically stripping the rest of the country to support the operation in Ukraine at this time, and that's not sustainable. So um, here's one interesting thing I found out about this, and I knew, I'd, I'd heard that a lot of the bulk of the manpower are conscripts, draftees, and uh, they are on basically a one-year contract, which for most of them runs out in one April. Well, that's right around the corner, so what are they going to do? Are they going to extend those people? Uh, are they going to get new people? And what is gonna, what's going on with that? Um, I think that it, whatever way you look at it, Russia's in a crack because if the conscripts that they have, they extend, then their morale and uh, fighting effectiveness is going to be worse than it is now, which apparently it's pretty bad. I've seen some videos of a whole bunch of them holed up in a barn complaining about no food, no water, no nothing, and they want them to sign a paper or they won't let them out. So <laughs> it's a problem, and I think it's getting ready to hit the fan real soon now. So let's talk about Russian losses. Um, the, uh, uh, they're extreme. Um, apparently, the Ukrainians are, are claiming that the losses are about 14,000 Russians killed. 
Uh, as of a few days, a week ago, the U.S. was saying about 7,000. Uh, the uh, Russians are claiming a whole lot less, but um, the, uh, it may be as much as the Ukrainians are counting. But if you look at those numbers, that's uh, more than the U.S. losses in Iraq and Afghanistan, to give you a handle on that. Uh, it's more than the total U.S., twice as much as the total U.S. losses at Iwo Jima in World War II. And the Marines, that was the worst, the bloodiest battle, worst losses for American forces in one small, one battle, one battle. Uh, that, was, that was really bad. Uh, so I want to quote you uh, a, a thing on losses right here. According to the Kyiv Independent, Ukrainian armed forces on Wednesday morning released uh, indicative estimates of Russia's losses as of March 16th, which amounted to, as I said, 14,000 people. That's not a quote. But as of 9 a.m., Ukraine's military had destroyed uh, 1,375 armored personnel carriers, 819 vehicles, 430 tanks, 190 artillery systems, 60 fuel tanks, 70 multiple launch rocket systems. MLRS is one of the big things in that battlefield now. Uh, 108 helicopters and 84 aircraft, 43 anti-aircraft warfare systems, 11 UAVs, and two boats. Of course, the U.S. estimates are lower, and Russian claims are a lot less. And as I said in the first video, we're not going to know the truth and the actual numbers for quite a while, and it's all ongoing. Um, one thing that's interesting is, is apparently the defense of Kyiv has hardened, and the Ukraines are, have got two rings of uh, defense rings around the city blocking the Russians, and they're not making much progress at all. Still can art, they can still uh, fire artillery and uh, missiles into Kyiv, and that's happening. Putin has fired eight generals, which is uh, because of the performance, and that's kind of interesting. But Ukraine has also killed four generals, so that's a turnover of 12. Two of those generals have been by snipers. The, uh, they, the Ukrainians were able to identify and pinpoint the location of, their, of these generals that were killed by snipers via uh, communication security, and then as in none. Uh, so that's, uh, that's pretty interesting. Uh, the rumors are that the Russian missile strike west of Lviv, LVIV, near Poland, was the result of pure, poor Ukraine uh, radio security, and the target was the base where uh, the Ukrainian forces would bring in international people, international peacekeeping, something or another, and they do training and stuff like that. And uh, the Russians got a hold of the idea that uh, there were a bunch of foreign fighters there, and so they targeted it with uh, some new weapons, and I'll talk about those here in just a second, cruise missiles. Uh, so they, they uh, Ukraine reported 35 killed, Russia claims 180 uh, people were killed, uh, so we don't have exact numbers on that, but uh, apparently one of, the, one of the things that Russians are claiming is they killed uh, a Canadian sniper by the name of Oliver Levine Ortiz, and he was uh, credited as being the, the most uh, successful sniper, um, maybe of all time, who knows. But he's got a, a great reputation. He's also an author, and you can find a couple of his books on Amazon. Uh, so I find, that, uh, I find that very interesting. OPSEC, radio, radio security, is, is everything. You just can't say stuff in the clear. Uh, let's talk about those missiles real quick. Uh, they were fired from uh, Belarus and the Black Sea. Air, it looked like they were air-launched, uh, probably from MiG-31s. It looks like these were new cruise missiles, the KH-101 and 102, and possibly the Caliber. Another new missile is the uh, KH-47M2. It's a hypersonic missile. They say Mach 5, uh, five times the speed of sound, maybe as much as 10 with a range of 1,200 miles. Uh, that was uh, launched from a MiG-31 at a Ukraine uh, arms depot. So that's, this is actually the first use of this hypersonic missile in combat. It's capable of carrying nuclear warhead as well. So kind of an, it, uh, uh, an interesting thing, uh, kind of a big deal. Uh, it's hard to tell at this point, but all these missiles are fairly new to the Russian inventory, and some of them have been used in Syria, so they've been testing them. Um, Another new missile is the Iskander-M, and that's more of a medium-range ballistic missile. 
and Dutch been fired at Kiev and at, uh, at Mariupol. And at Mariupol, they found these strange new munitions. It's like a dart, a lawn dart, and uh, with burn marks, et cetera. So they pull these apart, and they find that uh, what these are is uh, they're, uh, they're actually uh, penetration aids. Uh, they're things that you use to confound uh, tracking radars and weapons, counter, uh, counter weapons. So uh, they broadcast, uh, they have a flare, that's what those burn marks are. Then if they have an infrared tracker, it, go, it bites off on the flare rather than the uh, missile. Uh, and by this time, the, war, it, the motor's already burned out, so it's coasting. And so it's not as hot as it would be as if the motor is running. So the flare begs off, it pulls off the uh, uh, infrared scanners or uh, tracking systems on the, tar on the, uh, the counteroffensive weapons. And uh, they transmit and uh, radio to jam essentially radar tracking. And it's just another uh, tracking device or another device. So which one of these, you know, there's six of them on an Iskander M. And which one of the seven different things is actually the target? It makes it more highly likely that the uh, the uh, warhead's going to make it to its target. So there's that. The other thing I wanted to talk about is peace talks. Uh, there have been some of these, uh, but they're all seem to me to be a bunch of Russian posturing, and we're going to demand this and demand that. Uh, Zelensky apparently has said, "Okay, we'll say we'll not be part of NATO," and that's a, a pretty big uh, give, but. Uh, there's, uh, there hasn't really been anything from that, and I think most of that is because, as I said in the first video, that Russia is not in a position of strength right now to get rid of the leverage uh, or to use this leverage to get rid of the uh, uh, sanctions. Okay, so I think Odessa and Mariupol and uh, areas to the south to block them off, block Ukraine off from the Black Sea are part of that. Obviously, they're not going to get Kiev at this point. That's going to take a lot more troops. And uh, it's going to be a mess. That's what the leveling strategy is all about. But uh, anyway, that's the update as I see it, update number one. And uh, we'll keep at it. But uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Flywire.